Good morning, students. Today, our topic of discussion is route of drug administration. So, so coming under the route of drug administration, why anyone needs to know the route of drug, different routes of drug administration? So, we have n number of drugs which has been which can be given to different routes. So, we have to know the different routes for different medication uh, for many factors like patients, uh, patients' feasibility. Uh, complaints of the drug, absorption of the drug, um, side effects of the drug, so and so on. So before going to the topic proper, you have to know uh, some points on uh, regarding pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic. So these are the two main branches in pharmacology that deals with the drug and the effect of drug in our body. So pharmacokinetics deals with what the body does to the drug. That is, it, it explains how the drug is absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and excreted from the body. So at the same time, pharmacodynamic, this is this talks about what the drug does to the body. Okay. So coming to the topic, when does a drug exert its pharmacological effect? So you all know that when the drug reaches its site of action, then only it will exert its pharmacological effect. So root of drug administration, major roots are enteral, parenteral, and topical. Under enteral, you have oral, you have sublingual root, you have rectal root. Under parenteral, you have injections, inhalations, and transdermal. And under topical, you have conjunctival, nasal, auditory, mucosal areas, vaginal and urethral region, and injunction and dermal. So these are the main routes and which we can give different drugs and uh, according to their action and absorption. So as we all know, uh, commonly used routes are like pa under parental, you'll get intravenous, intramuscular, subcutaneous, and uh, through oral or sublingual, inhalational patches, like the transdermal patches, rectal, and also topical. So these are the most commonly used route of drug administration where you can see in a normal hospital setup. So factors governing choice of route. So how we are going to select a root of drug, root for a drug. <clears throat> First is its physical and chemical properties of the drug. So under physical, it comes like uh, what the drug form is like it's a solid or it's a liquid form or it is in a gaseous form. <clears throat> for solid form, like oral tablets, capsules, all these things are taken by oral root, like liquid form syrups, uh, all these things are comes under a liquid form. And uh, if a gaseous state, it's like, um, anesthetic medications, which is given through inhalational route. And chemical properties depends on the lipid solubility, acid, uh, whether it's a, a weak, weak, drug, weak acidic or weak basic drugs, or it is uh, depending upon the molecular weight of the drug, all this comes under chemical properties. Second is rate and extent of absorption from various routes. So whenever you're giving a drug, we should know how fast it is getting absorbed and how extent it is getting absorbed. So some drugs like which are um, which are as uh, acid uh, stable can be given through oral route. Uh, from the acid level, like enzymes or your insulin, it can't be given through oral route because your gastric juices will destroy. So that absorption will be no absorption, literally no absorption for those drugs. So to know for IV route, uh, if the rate and extent of absor absorption will be very good and uh, bioavailability will be hundred percent. So the bioavailability of the drug also depends upon the rate and extent of the absorption. <coughs> Next, the effect of digested juices and first fast effect. As I already said, the drugs which are acid stable, so which can't be destroyed by the gastric juices can be given through oral route. Or if the drug as, as, as uh, your stomach is highly acidic in nature, so whenever you are giving some weekly basic drugs, they get ionized in your digestive juices and can't be absorbed. So um, accordingly, we have to select the drug for oral route. 
and first pass metabolism we all know that whenever the drug is given through oral route it passes into the into it, it directly taken to the portal way circulation into the liver where your first metabolism happens so that is called as first pass effect in this we will be losing some amount of drug before it reaching its systemic circulation next is site of desired action so whenever you need to give a drug so it, if it is given directly to the desired site the action will be better for example if you want to give any topical a uh, solution topical drops or topical ointment for a um, any um, regional uh, disease for example for conjunctivitis if you want to give any drops if it is directly installed in the eye installed in the eye the effect will be better next is rapidity of the desired response so in which route it can be absorbed rapidly that is the rapidity of the desired response Next is accuracy of dosage. So the it, uh, according to the route, you can correct the accuracy. For example, for IV route, you can correctly uh, give can can calculate the accuracy of the dosage and give because none not even a single um, not even a small amount of drug is wasted in IV. But for oral route, as I already said, the variability varies, but not hundred percent accuracy also varies in condition of the patient. so condition of the patient is a main factor for deciding this uh, route of drug administration because if the patient is cooperative the patient is um, uh, willing to take any medication orally so it can be given if the patient is having any other condition like nausea vomiting it can't be given any oral drug or if the patient is in comatose stage or if the patient is having any seizures patient can't be given any oral drug so accordingly depending on the condition of the patient we have to select the route so coming to the routes proper uh, first is enteral route as we already said enteral route means we whatever a drug we are giving directly to a gi tract that is enteral means intestine the placement of drug into any part of your git is called as enteral route <coughs> oral route so advantages of oral route are it is safe it's convenient it's economical so usually good absorption is seen there can be self administered and it is painless so most of the patient will be going for oral route because of all these advantages but the disadvantages are if we can't say how much drugs absorb first thing second thing the absorption will be very slow third the patient if he if he is given any irritant irritant or unpalatable drugs he can't able to take it orally it can induce vomiting or nausea and in uncooperative and unconscious patient you can't give any oral route and some drugs are destroyed due to your high acidic gastric juices and first pass metabolism is inevitable so yeah any drug which is given through oral route should go through first pass metabolism so these are some of the disadvantages of oral route so as i already said this is a first pass metabolism so whenever you are giving any drug from the gi tract it is taken to by the portal circulation to the liver for biotransformation or mechanism metabolism of the drug and then it is released into a general circulation examples for solid uh, drug it is a solid form it is tablet capsules and powders for liquid form it is syrup elixir and mixture uh, mixture sublingual and buffer so these um, solid and liquids these are mostly given through oral route sublingual and buccal route So sublingual is called as sublingual. So below the tongue or beneath the tongue, if you are giving any drug, it's called as sublingual root. Buccal is in the buccal mucosa or buccal cavity. So when uh, some drugs can be crushed and spread over the buccal mucosa. So these are the pictures depicting your sublingual and buccal root of drug administration. So sublingual advantages are they are economical, drug absorption is quick, pus pus avoided as they are directly absorbed. To, with your um, um, blood circulation, quick termination. If you need any quick termination, the, the patient can spit off the drug at any time. If you if you want to terminate the action, and it can be self-administered. Mm -hmm. The disadvantages are unpalatable and bitter drugs can't be given because patient may feel nausea, vomiting, and uh, sometimes the drug can cause irritation of oral mucosa if they are given continuously. And large quantities drug cannot be given. high molecular weight drugs cannot be absorbed through this route 
Examples for sublingual are systemic use like isorbid dinitrate, nitroglycerin, nifedipine, some of the drugs which is given for systemic use. Local is antiseptic lozenge. <coughs> Next is re rectal root. So advantages of rectal root are it is mostly it can be used in children and little or no first pass effect. So first pass effect, effect is bypassed here. It can be used in patients who are uh, having vomiting or unconscious patient you can give. Higher concentrations are rapidly absorbed or achieved, and gastric irritants can also be given through this route. Some of the disadvantages are patient may feel embarrassed for, uh, by uh, giving the drug through this route, and it is mostly inconvenient for the patient. Absorption is slow and uh, erratic, so you can't predict how much the drug is absorbed. Irritation or inflammation of the rectal mucosa can occur for some of the drugs. So this is the pre-packed enema container. You, we all know enema is given through parectal root. <coughs> so these are some of the examples for rectal root. The lo for local effects like Delcolex, glycerin suppositories, enema, ointment, these are all for local effects. For systemic effects like aminophil and endomethacin suppositories. So here the picture depicts the suppositories which can be given through rectal root. So coming to parental root. That is parental. Apart from enteral roots, are called as parental roots. So roots other than the enteral are called parental. So in this picture, it depicts that see when the drug is given orally, it goes into liver for first pass metabolism. Then it reaches rest of your body. But in IV, it is bypassing your liver and no first pass metabolism directly. Whatever drug you are giving, hundred percent enters into your systemic circulation, and the effect is achieved. Concurrently, administration of the drug by the parental root. So uh, the first picture shows the layer of the skin. See, we, are, we know first layer is the epidermis followed by your dermis followed by subcutaneous tissue and then the muscle. So this is the layer of the skin. And right side picture depicts the angle of each uh, intramus intra derm sorry each uh, parental root of administration. So intramuscular, as we all know, muscle is the deeper structure. So it needs 90 degree angle for injecting any drug. Subcutaneous is the third layer. So it needs 45 degree angle to reach that subcutaneous layer. Intradermal is just next to your epidermis. So it 10 to 15 degrees more than enough to deliver the drug in this layer. Intradermal root. So intradermal is the outer layer just beneath your Epidermis, the amount of drug which is given through intradermal is very, very small. That is like not more than 0.1 ml and the absorption is also slow. <clears throat> Mostly we use tuberculin syringe for this intradermal injections. Examples are BCG vaccine, diagnostic tests like Monto test for your TB allergy and allergic sensation tests are done through intradermal. And most of your antibiotic test doses are given through intradermal root of administration. So this is how the intradermal is given. These are some of the sites where you can do your intradermal injections. So whenever you give some intradermal root uh, injections, you will be seeing a blub is formed. So when the whenever the blub is formed, you should not rub over the rub, rub it on the, you should not rub it on the blub. You have to mark the blub and you should note down the time and the medications given to see for any adverse reactions so, sensed by any patient. So after that only, it is advised to give a particular drug to the patient. Subcutaneous administration um, is also called as, uh, sub, it's just beneath your dermis. <clears throat> this is injection under the skin. Merits are, these are smooth but slow absorption. Depot injections or implants can, are mostly kept in this layer. Some of the examples are in local anesthetics are given in subcutaneous layer and the systemic uses insulin. Insulin most commonly given in subcutaneous layer. And demerits are only small volume. As I already said in intradermal, only 0.1 ml is given. Here, one up to one ml you can give. Irritant drugs, if you are giving without knowingly or accidentally, if any irritant drug is given, the area, the skin around that uh, area will get uh, necros and slough, sloughing of the seam. It is not suitable for shock patients because in shock we have to give more amount of fluids. So as we already know, very very small amount of drug is given, like one ml, it is not suitable for patient in shock. 
so intramuscular injections so most common site for intramuscular injection is deltoid gluteus and vastus so mm -hmm. this is the picture depicting your deltoid muscle your uh, dorsal gluteal muscle and ventral gluteal muscle and vastus lateralis muscle so intramuscular root advantages of intramuscular root is absorption is reasonably uniform rapid onset of action is seen mild irritants can be given first pass is avoided gastric factors can be avoided so these are some of the advantages for intramuscular root and disadvantages are here also you have volume restriction like up to 10 ml drug is only can be given and local pain and abscess can be seen uh, in uh, some cases and comparatively to oral this is expensive and if you are not following the aseptic precaution patient can have infection at the site of injection and if if it is not uh, if if it is given without knowing a proper anatomical region it can even cause nerve damage so intravenous administration the merits of intravenous administration are as i already said you are directly giving the drug into your systemic circulation so there will be 100% absorption will be there so no first pass metabolism quick onset of action as it reaches the desired site within a second so option onset of action is also quick it can be given in uncooperative and unconscious patients and the patients who are having nausea vomiting can also be given intravenous administration hypertonic solutions and even irritants can be given through intravenous administrations and large volume can be given you can be you can give any fluid supplements like fluids for in a liters amount of drugs can be controlled accurately so whenever you don't need any drug action you can terminate you can uh, decrease or you can correct the accuracy of the amount of drug given through intravenous some of the demerits are strict aseptic condition is needed because you are directly injecting a drug into your systemic circulation so strict antiseptic condition should be maintained so it always intravenous drug, uh, drug administration needs someone to instill the drug like skilled person needed for in giving intravenous administration it's painful and can be risky because whenever the drug is given you can't recall the drug embolism is also one of the main disadvantage or demerit so if the if no if it is not given through skillful person it can lead to embolism suspensions oily drugs or depots can't be given because this can also cause embolism venous thrombosis and phlebitics can occur if it is given under septic conditions if it is not uh, if aseptic precautions not followed it can go for phlebitis and if it is if a drug is given through intravenous administration for longer duration they can also have thrombosis and phlebitis so necrosis can occur due to exacerbation of the drugs like as i already said irritants or hypotonic solution given to intravenous administration if the drug get extra vesicated around the area it can cause necrosis of the tissue some of the examples of intravenous drug administration are iv infusions like ringolactate dextrose 5% dns and dopamin iv bolus like diazepam adenosine and insulin then coming to intra rtg <clears throat> so name from the name it is very clear that rt is a drug which is given directly into the arteries are called as intra arterial so you know side is domain of the artery so we are giving the drug inside the artery so merits are greater concentration of drug can be delivered so higher concentration can be given the merits is it required highly skilled person or expertise to deliver the drug and should be followed with strict aseptic precautions examples are more, most commonly given the drug or a dye which radiopic contrast which is given for coronary angiography and for cerebral angiography so these are some of the example for intra arterial route so here femoral artery is is shown where the drug is injected it is intra peritoneal so here also from the name it is it is very clear that the drug is given directly to the peritoneal space so merits are rapid absorption because it has a large surface area so absorption is very rapid if you are giving to intraperitoneum d merits are it's very painful risky need expertise for uh, administration sometimes post 
uh, intraperitoneal retrograde milking can lead to adhesions. Sometimes even peritonitis, if it is not following strict aseptic conditions. Examples, mainly uh, this intraperitoneal route is used for dialyzing you have peritoneal region for your kidney failure or for any poisoning and most commonly used in lab animals for drug installation. So left side picture depicts the intraperitoneal drug installation in, your, in uh, rats or mice. In right side, this is the picture depicting your peritoneal dialysis. So first is infusion of dialysis solution to your peritoneal cavity and uh, draining the content via catheter. The second picture. Next is intrathecal. So intrathecal is also called as intraspinal root. <coughs> so here, the site you have to reach is your subarachnoid space. The merits are, as you are directly entering into the subarachnoid space, you are bypassing both your blood brain barrier and also your blood CSF barrier. So the drug directly act on your meninges and the spinal cord. So demerits are strict, very, very strict aseptic condition is required and skillful doctors like anesthetists mostly use this uh, route. It's very painful and it's very risky also because if uh, aseptic precaution is not maintained, the patient can end up in encephalitis and can even endanger the patient's life also. So some of the examples are radiopic contrast media and xylocan injection mainly for your, uh, during your any surgeries and antibiotics for your infection like meningitis, encephalitis, all these things, this is also given through so, uh, intrathecal root. So this is how intrathecal or intraspinal injection is given. Next is epidural. So here, it is given through vertebral interspace between dura and lining of your spinal cord. So example is xylocal injection. The most commonly used nowadays we are doing, giving epidural injection is for your vaginal delivery. So it uh, decreases the pain. So here the catheter is placed in the epidural space and whenever the patient is in pain, they will be injecting a drug. So it can, uh, the catheter is left behind. So whenever you need, you can inject drug and the patient can be relieved of the pain. And it's also mainly given for some cancer patients to relieve pain. This is how the epidural needle is there and catheter is inserted, catheter is left in the place. And whenever you need any drug, to, in, whenever you need any uh, anesthetic drug to be injected, it is given or any painkillers can be given through this route. Next is intramedullary. So it is itis mainly bone marrow, either it's a tibia or sternal bone marrow. Merits, onset of action is very fast and demerits is strict aseptic condition needed, expertise and skill is required. Third, it's painful and risky. Examples, bone marrow transplantation. So for any bone marrow transplantation or for any biopsy to be taken, it is uh, given, it is uh, used, this route is used. Next is intra-articular. Aside is injection directly given to the joint space. Uh, meritus high concentration can be given this localized area. Demerits are aseptic condition should be strictly followed. And uh, on uh, regular injections, it can cause jo joint damage and even pain. Examples, hydrocortisone gold chloride for water arthritis. <coughs> Intracardiac injection. So the injection is given in the, in the left to fourth intercostal space into the heart directly. It is mainly given during cardiac arrest. For example, adrenaline drug is given. This is the picture depicting intracardiac injection. Next, coming to inhalational route. The site is, um, it is given, it is, as it is inhalation, it is directly inspired through nose or mouth. Merits are it's fast and it's quick because uh, your lung is having large surface area due to n number of alveoli present and can be self-administered. Demerits are increased bronchial and salivary secretions whenever you are taking some inhalational drug. Example, salbutamol sodium chromoglycate, which is given in the major dose inhalers. Most commonly, we all know this inhalational route is given for asthmatic patients and for allergic conditions. 
So what are the other route of inhalation? I mean, other um, examples for inhalational route? Mm -hmm. uh, apart from meter dose inhalers, we can give uh, rotahalers. Rotahalers can be given. And uh, rotahalers can be given. Your nebulizers are given through inhalation to properly. So this is how we'll instruct the patients to take an immediate dose inhaler. Next is intranasal. <coughs> Drugs are directly given in, directed in, directly into the nose, instilled directly into the nose. So desmo, example is desmopressin, which is given intranasally in the treatment of diabetes insipidus, and salmon calcitonin, which is given for osteoporosis. These are some of the drugs which are given intranasally, which is directly instilled in the nose. GNH analogs can also be given. And coming to topical or local route. So it is the drug applied on the mucous membrane of your eye, ear, nose, throat, mouth, urinary bladder, vagina, and rectum. So the drug which is directly applied over your mucous membrane is called as topical route. Ointments, creams, lotions, and powders are used by this route. So coming to topical, um, so for conjunctival, nasal, auditory mucosa, normally we use drops or sprays. For vaginal and urethral, we'll be giving solutions, ointments, emulsions, suppositories, pessaries, pencil-shaped bodies, all these things. Like for injun injunctions and dermal, um, injunction means the drug which is given by rubbing onto the skin. Like you are uh, vapor ups or your uh, painkiller gels, all these things, and dust and sprays. So, by this, a topic on route of drug administration gets over. So, now we'll pass on to the next topic, which is in drug transportation. So coming to uh, drug transportation. So in the la last topic, we have discussed about pharmacokinetic, which is a quantitative study of a drug movement in, through, and out of the body. So uh, as I already said, ADME comes under pharmacokinetics, that is absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And pharmacodynamics means what the drug does to the body. There is a concentration of the drug in the plasma or in the related, and its related effect is called as dynamics. So, so why we need to learn about drug transportation? So what is drug transportation? So movement of drug across the biological membrane or barriers are called as drug transport. So we all know that biological membrane this is a bilayer of phospholipid and cholesterol molecules, and they have one polar head and a non-polar tail. And these biological membrane are hundred and and strong thick. thick. So any drug which is highly lipid soluble can cross this membrane easily. And they are, if they are less lipid soluble, if they are water soluble, it needs some other means to transport across the cell membrane. So the paracellular spaces which uh, and some channels are there for these non-lipid soluble drugs and water soluble drugs. And this is the picture depicting your bilipid layer of your cell membrane. So this is your uh, cross-section of your uh, bilipid layer. So you, you can see uh, hydrophilic head, heads, that is polar heads and non-polar tails. They are bilipid two layers and some pore intrinsic protein, which, is, which forms a pore through which your water soluble or non-lipid soluble drugs can pass through. So the intrinsic protein, uh, which uh, some your uh, lipid soluble drugs can cross through directly across your bilipid layer. So this is transport mechanism. You have a different mechanism like passive diffusion, 
filtration, carrier mediated transport, and your vesicular transfer. Under carrier mediator, um, you have facilitated diffusion, active transport. Again, it has been divided into primary active and secondary active. So together, carrier mediated transport and vesicular transport is called a specialized transport. So coming to passive diffusion. <clears throat> so name here suggests that passive means without any uh, expenditure of any energy and moving from concentration gradient high to low. So the most important mechanism for majority of the drug is passive diffusion. Here, the rate of drug transported is proportional with your lipid water part partition coefficient of the drug. So lipid soluble drugs diffuses by dissolving in the lipoidal matrix of the membrane, as I already said, can easily diffuse. And more lipid soluble drugs attains higher concentration in the membranes and diffuses quickly. So this is how a passive diffusion takes place. So passive diffusion is high lipid soluble drug directly passed through the membrane and comes to the higher concentration to lower concentration. And those are non-lipid soluble drugs will pass through their spaces as we already saw their pores. So influence of pH. So pH is very, very important for transport of a drug. Most of the drugs, what we are giving are weak electrolytes. The ionization of the drug depends upon the pH. So whenever the strong electrolytes Whenever the weak acid get placed in the uh, alkaline medium in get ionized, weak basic weak alkaline drugs kept in your uh, acidic medium in get ionized. So main barrier of the drug absorption is CF pH. So pK is equal to pH, which is derived from the henderson hazelberg equation. So we have to know this for amount of drug can transport across the membranes. So acidic drugs are highly lipid soluble at acidic pH and basic drugs are highly lipid soluble at basic pH. That is, acidic drugs are absorbed in acidic medium, basic drugs are absorbed in basic medium. Implications are acidic drugs, these are unionized acidic pH, basic drugs unionized in basic pH. So same, same the drug with the same pH or a Ionized, the drug in a different pH gets ionized. That is a simple concept. So uh, why we have to know about this? Because you will be learning about ion trapping. So ion trapping is happens whenever your acidic drug gets trapped in your basic medium. Okay. So basic drugs attain higher concentration intracellularly. Yes, because cells are basic in alkaline nature. So basic drugs automatically will be absorbed more within the cell. Acid drugs are ionized in the alkaline urine, excreted faster. So coming to filtration. Drugs through aqueous pores in the membrane or through paracellular space is called as filtration. So they just pass through like a filter. So lipid insoluble drugs with smaller molecular size can also pass through the pores. So you'll be having some pores. It's, it will be like a seam like structure. Just the drugs will pass through like a filter. That's called filtration. Coming to carrier transport. Features of carrier transport are all cell membranes express transmembrane proteins which serve as a carrier. <clears throat> we all know. So it transports ions, nutrients, metabolites, transmitters across the membrane. So it combines transiently with the substrate, undergo a conformational change, and carries the substrate to other side of the membrane. The substrate dissociates and transport is from the back. So this is how a carrier medium transport works. So whenever any drug is coming and sitting on the transport, it just makes conformational change. It pulls in the drug, it uh, leaves the drug in the cell and dissociates back to the position. So carrier transport is specific for the substrate saturable, competitively inhibited by an analogs, which replace the same transport. Coming to facilitated transport. So it translocates the substrate in the direction of its electrochemical gradient, that is from higher to lower concentration, passively without needing any energy. Here, the transporter belongs to superfamily of solute carrier transport. It merely facilitates permeation of the poorly diffusible substrate. Just it helps for the movement of dif uh, less diffus diffusible drugs. Example, the entry of glucose into the muscle and fat um, by the glucose transport of GLUT4. <clears throat> active transport, the transporters the transport solute against its electrochemical energy. So active, active means with the expenditure of energy. So whenever the drug, whenever the transport, uh, transport 
transport solute against its electrochemical gradient with low to higher concentration with the expenditure of energy is called as active transport. This results in selective accumulation of substance on one side of the membrane. Primary active transport is energy is obtained by hydrolysis of ATP. So whenever ATP is uh, utilized, then it is called primary active transport. As some of the transporters belong to this super belong to this carrier, active transport of uh, ATP binding cassette. Uh, they mediate only efflux of the solute from the cytoplasm either to extracellular fluid or into the intracellular organelle. Okay, either they efflux out or they influx the drug. These are encoded by MDR1 gene, P glycoprotein, MRP2, and BCR proteins. Excess secondary active transport. So transporters trans these transport solute against its electrochemical, it's also against the electrochemical gradient that is from low to higher concentration, which requires energy. The difference between primary and secondary is in primary ATP satellites, in secondary, mostly the solute takes the energy from the other solute, which helps in its movement across the uh, membrane. For example, whenever a potassium is moved along with sodium, it takes energy from the sodium. So in uh, this SLC transporters belong to this category. And here you have two types of secondary active transport. One is antiport, one is symport. From the name, it suggests that antiport is against two opposite directions. That is, the both the ions or both the drugs are moving in opposite direction. In symport or are port transporters, they are traveling the same direction, as we can see in uh, glucose transport. <coughs> so this is the a picture which depicts here. Here you can see SLC family where the higher concentration to lower concentration is taking back. So that means this belongs to which carrier protein? Come on, which carrier protein? So we know that which belongs it belongs to facilitated carrier protein because here you can see no energy is spent. So this is facilitated. So coming to your ATP cyclase, that is primary active transport. Okay, here it is moving on the same direction, same opposite direction. That is, then it is called as sorry. See, this is moving in the same direction. So here it is move in this molecule is moving in this direction. This is also moving in the same direction. This is called symporter. Here it is moving in the opposite direction. It's called antiporter. <coughs> So as I said, this is a facilitated diffusion, this primary active, the symport, it's an antiport. Coming to vesicular transport. So certain substances with very large or impermeable molecule which cannot be transported across the membrane will be transported by vesicular transport. Here, either in, uh, a blood is formed within the cell or from the uh, cell membrane. Okay, a binding protein located on the membrane complexes with the substance and initiates a vesicle formation. The fate of what will happen to the vesicle either it detaches from the membrane which remains stored within the cells or it may release the substance into the cytoplasm or it may move to the opposite membrane fuse with it to release the substance across the cell membrane like exocytosol. It can bring something from inside the cell, it can leave it outside the cell. So this is a picture depicting here vesicular transport here. Whenever any drug or particle coming in sitting on your transporter medium, it is the cell membrane is pulled down and forms a sheet, so it encircles around itself, forming a blood. And this, from which after entering into the cytoplasm, releases the drug and again it reaches your cell membrane or any substance which has to be uh, taken out from the cell is also formed like a blood and comes to the surface. The blood is opened up and the particles are released. This is called exocytosis. So take home points from this topic is, so you have to know what is pharmacokinetic, that is what the body does to the drug. And you have to know about pharmacodynamic, what the drug does to the body. And you have to know unionized drugs are absorbed and unionized drugs are excreted. So lipids, lipid soluble drugs cross the membrane without any expenditure of energy and water soluble drugs pass through the pores. Passive transport, where the drug moves from the higher concentration to lower concentration. In carrier mediated, transmembrane proteins are there for transferring the drugs across the membrane. 
in primary active transport you know that atp is used as energy in secondary the energy is replaced from the other solute which helps in uh, transport of other uh, solute transport of proteins examples are slc ndr1 p glycoprotein mrp2 brcp etc so these are some of the take home points thank you